All right, I'm here with Teresa, the Director of Operations and Programming here at the Palace Theater. Uh, I understand you're going to give us a little bit of a tour of the place? I'm going to give you the whirlwind tour here. The theater was open in 1926 in the height of vaudeville times when that was all the rage. You know, this was before video games, before television, even before radio. Well, no, radio came, anyhow. <laughs> so. So uh, this theater opened as the Manos Theater. It was built by a family of Greek immigrants. There were five brothers and a cousin that opened it, having evolved it from a smaller theater that was on the site in 1920 that seated only 540. The Rialto Theater seated 540. So as vaudeville became popular, they bought the land, expanded the property, and opened a theater which at that time seated over 2,100 people. And opening night, they had 5,000 people. It was the Manos Theater um, for years. Warner Brothers bought it in 1930 and had it for over 40 years until the 70s. Um, in the early 70s, it was sold out to Cinemet Theaters in Pittsburgh. Then it went into private hands in the late 70s. And then our company, Westmoreland Cultural Trust, bought it in 1990 and started a series of renovations that have gone on all these 20 some years in here to get it up to speed with uh, able to host contemporary tours with sound and lighting equipment, air conditioning, uh, and we'll see some of the other projects that we've done over the years. Excellent. Take us in. Sure. This is the outer lobby here with the uh, red and uh, white and black tile that's original to the theater. When we come through here, you'll see the chandelier, which is also thought to be the original chandelier as well. Oh, wow. Grecian marble, the family from Greece that built it, as I mentioned. This was quarried from their homeland in the Greek islands of Tyros. The staircase is Vermont marble. There were not mirrors at the time the theater opened. This uh, area in front of us was just curtains. Mm -hmm. And a candy counter, uh, right there were the glass cases, there was a candy counter there. And uh, the guests would come in. Uh, adjacent to this at the time was a candy shop. Uh -huh. And that is now the area we've made into the Megan Suite uh, for refreshments before and during intermission of a show. It's also rented out for private parties and special events. So everybody comes in, if you can imagine 2,100 people coming through. Yeah, what, <laughs> these, what is it, what are, what are these These here? are a collection of cameras that thank gosh, were stashed by some hoarder <laughs> <laughs> uh, that even predate the 1920s. They were probably used in some of the vaudeville theaters even before in the wow. late 1800s, um, possibly early 1900s. And we have some vintage projectors upstairs too that date from the early 1900s. We're not sure how and, and how they were used here, but mm -hmm. the fact that some of them are, are kerosene fueled or oil fueled and not even electric, you know, <laughs> they're just awesome collector pieces that That's we have fascinating. here. So this marble has been here since the 20s? Yes, 1926. Wow. And this floor. The same floor too? The same floor. It's in remarkable shape. Mm -hmm. You haven't had to restore? The, well, there were area rugs over it at some uh, point. Oh, you know. wow. But, um, so the mezzanine area here is uh, an obvious spot for refreshments for guests to come in here. Some of the outstanding features in this area include the Spanish-inspired goldfish pond no with kidding. this uh, tile in here with peacocks carved into there and subtle shades of blue and yellow and pink in the tile around there. We did have a goldfish pond here until some mechanical uh, failures with the pump, um, but it was designed as a goldfish pond. And when you turn around to look at the chandelier from this vantage point, you can see the blue, pink, and yellow flowers at the top that pick up some of the subtle shades from the goldfish pond. And, and again, that is thought to be the original chandelier with um, some LED lights mm -hmm. in now uh, at the base of it um, and in the candles things if we've got some wiring issues on a few of those. Yeah. But um, those were replaced by LED lights for power. So those savings. would have been just regular candles back in Well, the not flame candles, but other electric candles that weren't LED lights, incandescent okay. lights. Okay. Down here we have our PENC historical archive that has some of the vintage cameras I mentioned from the early 1900s. And these seats were in our basement that are thought to be from the Rialto Theater because all of the end caps had the R's on them, not every letter of the alphabet. So we think they might have been from the Rialto Theater in 1920. Uh, wow. And behind are some pictures of projectionists that worked here in the 50s. They were donated to us by a former projectionist that also gave us union charters that date from 1911 and 1913 that are on the side. Now these wall. projectors are original from this building? Uh, they probably predate that because some of them from the brass markers on them appear to be from 1918, 1915. Okay. So they could have been used in another Somewhere theater in the too. area. Wow. 
So the parts up here that are noteworthy include the murals on the side walls next to the loge seating. Those were painted by Louis Grell, G-R-E-L-L, -L, from United Studios of Chicago. There was also a third mural that he did that was painted above the orchestra pit behind underneath those comedy tragedy masks that spanned the whole way across. They had been covered by the red and gold fabric that you see higher up on the walls here. And in the mid-90s, the trust re, uh, removed the fabric and revealed the furring strips that were nailed into each painting. Over 1,500 nails were put into these paintings to affix the fabric. And we brought in Christine Dalton, a locally based uh, restored conservator of art, and she restored them, starting with the one on the left wall, since that's an exterior wall, and then moving over to this one. They're based on French fairy tales, and we're not sure when or why they painted over the one at the top, <laughs> probably at the same time they covered the murals, mm -hmm. but we're pleased to have brought those back into uh, view for our guests. The other thing we replicated was the opera boxes that are on either side of the stage here. Um, those were based on drawings from blueprints we had from the original theater, and those were removed probably in the mid-70s because of deterioration and the fact that they were doing a lot of movies at the time and it wasn't a great vantage point mm. to view the movies. So we replicated those in the late 90s as well. Uh, other improvements have been the total replacement of all the seats up in this section. Uh, they first did the upper seats because those were wooden seats that had minimal padding on them and we removed over 200 in that area. Our total capacity now is 1369 compared to the original 2100 plus. Okay. We removed 200 some seats up there to make them more comfortable for our guests and also put in an elevator to reach both the mid-level and the top of the balcony to make it easier for patrons on a sellout show to get to those top rows. And so we replaced those first and then came down and did these seats because these two were old but not quite as uncomfortable. And actually some of the original loge seats were put in the very top of the balcony on either side. There are dark burgundy seats there that um, had that, that, that were used. They're mohair covered fabric that um, were moved up to there just to create some additional seating spaces. Wow. So we also put in new lighting and sound systems up here with the lighting perches, these brown uh, metal things that come down from the yeah. ceiling, create more front of house lighting for shows, for our touring shows. And above the proscenium arch, you see a mesh of, of sound panels, speaker panels behind there. There are also more speakers in different levels of the ceiling of the balcony area to maximize the sound quality up here for our guests. The location of these seats, as the saying goes, is to be seen, not to see well, but to be seen. Right. Yeah, because everybody <laughs> even sitting up there would be able to see. And you look so special here. It's not always the best place to see a show because right. it limits some of your view to the sides of the stage. But with headliners that are more in the central downstage, central part of the, of the stage, it's a great spot to view a comedian or a headliner or a performance here. Uh, maybe less so for a musical or a ballet or something like that. But it's a great spot, and we have uh, all of the opera box seats have naming rights on them, mm -hmm. and we extend naming rights to anybody that wants a seat with their name on an armrest <laughs> of a plaque um, to pick a seat in the theater, and we'll put a plaque on with your name or some inscription for you. The original seating configuration extended seats all the way up to the stage, and in fact, the front part of the stage is over the original orchestra pit. Oh, wow. So you can see where in moving more seats toward the front and closer together, um, we had the difference in the capacities from original to now, sure. and that they had hundreds more seats on the main floor here than we do today. Um, the pit seats are used for a lot of our rock concerts. They are not used when we have a show with a pit orchestra, of course. Uh, like a stage right production or the symphony orchestra's Nutcracker Ballet. So the orchestra would just set up right there where those removable seats are? Yes. Okay, I see. We no longer have a recessed gotcha. pit or a hydraulic lift, you know, to the yeah. front of the stage. So it's a great place. We have, uh, as Mike mentioned earlier, we have, uh, you know, up to 100, 110 shows a year here with national touring artists coming in. Um, you know, year round pretty much, and we're busier than ever. And we get people from all over the country, from all over the world, in fact. We have a lot of international guest stories that, you know, uh, we like to share with folks of, of this being a destination for people that have come halfway around the world to right. see, yeah. you know, somebody that's coming well, to Greensburg. Well, it's Greens definitely Park. known in this area as the, the venue, the, yes. the place where all the big names come. Who, who do we have coming up this year? Uh, that you're working Some on? Some upcoming events include Daughtry and Eddie Money and um, uh, Robin uh, Trower and uh, Pat, Ger Pat, Pat Benatar, sorry, oh, wow. Pat okay. Benatar and Neil nice. Gerardo. 
Uh, we've got a lot of shows. It's a totally revolving schedule. We don't mm -hmm. have a stop and a start to our season. It's a constantly evolving process. And what's been some of your favorites over over the years? Uh, some of the some of the acts that you have been. Well, for sentimental reasons, some of my favorites include the first show I booked was comedian Craig Ferguson. Oh, um, nice. Bernadette Peters was one of the first big headliners the Trust brought in in the late '90s, and she was de a delight to work with. Mm, wow. You know, we've had a lot of other great shows. I love the band America. I love the show Stomp and the Blue Man Group shows that we've brought in here. It's just great to see something that has played on Broadway. Right. And here it is at the Palace. Wow, that's fantastic. Teresa, thank you so much for giving us the brief tour around. It's an amazing facility. Uh, definitely please come out and support the Palace Theater and the Westmoreland Cultural Trust. This has been Cars in the Community.